Hello and welcome to the Business of Story. I'm your host, Mark Howell, and I'm so glad you're with me today. May I take just a second to read you something? This is from marketing legend Jim Knapp, who was VP of Business Development for the media giant Bonneville International after he was Director of Business Development for CBS Radio. As Jim describes himself, he's a guy on a mission to bring strategic marketing capabilities to local media companies. Here's what he wrote. I'm in the communications biz, so I've consumed just about everything ever produced about storytelling. And we all know that great stories can move mountains, but there are very few books, if any, that can teach you a proven process on just how to do it with intention and clarity. That's why I love this book, because it's more than a book. It's a workshop, a system, a planning tool to help you tell better stories, whether you run a business, consult, do marketing, speak publicly, sell something, anything, or just want to be more confident and convincing about the stories you tell about you to others and to yourself. So I just had to write and review in hopes of convincing you to get a copy of this ASAP. And by the way, is there a better time to improve your storytelling than right now? Well, thank you, Jim, for your Amazon review of my new book, Brand Bewitchery how to wield the story cycle system to craft spellbinding stories for your brand. With Brand Bewitchery, you'll not only craft a crystal clear brand story, you'll learn to apply three proven storytelling frameworks to help you captivate audiences, convert customers, and grow your people by telling your stories on purpose. Plus, I've even included a step-by-step story activation plan that will guide you in the launch of your new brand story. So whether you're building a company brand, refreshing an existing brand, branding an internal initiative, or want to grow the influence of your personal brand, grab your print or Kindle copy of Brand Bewitchery right now on Amazon. It's okay. You can pause this show, and I'll wait for you. We return you now to your regularly scheduled program. Welcome back. On today's show, we explore the importance of sharpening your personal brand story to help you not only navigate and grow through the COVID-19 pandemic, but to position you and your career to flourish following the pandemonium. Joining us is Bud Hansen, Executive Director of Professional and Corporate Education at Stetson University in Miami. A seasoned marketing and management professional, Bud began his career with Nestle Purina. During his 15 years there, Bud managed brands, salespeople, and many high-profile corporate and consumer events, such as the National Dog Show, all while earning his MBA and having a couple kids in the process. In 2004, Bud returned to his home state of Florida to start Fish On Marketing, a consulting agency focused on experiential marketing where he worked with many Fortune 100 brands such as MasterCard, NASCAR, Major League Baseball, and Coke, just to name a few. Bud also spent five years with Costa Sunglasses in Daytona, helping build a cult brand through a unique marketing strategy targeting the outdoor and angling communities. And his second entrepreneurial effort, Tribe Branding, works with salespeople, brands, and businesses to educate them on the power of storytelling. Today, Bud will share with you what you can do to sharpen your professional story through executive learning and upskilling. Plus, we'll talk about our new storytelling and business program Bud and I are launching in Stetson University's Professional and Corporate Education, or PACE, program starting on July 28th. So please welcome to the Business of Story, Bud Hansen. Bud, welcome to the show. Thank you, Park. So great to have you here. You have got an interesting background in advertising and marketing. As I was going through it, I love the name of your experiential marketing firm, Fish On Marketing, because I did a lot of fishing growing up in the Pacific Northwest, so I can appreciate that. But now you've moved into education, and we're going to cover all of that today and how people can you know, sharpen their storytelling skills, sharpen their executive skills so that they can have some career insurance moving forward in what is the most uncertain, crazy world we've ever lived in. So it's really great to have you here and hear from you on what people can be doing to position themselves for better futures through learning and higher ed. So, Thank you, Park. Appreciate uh, you having me and uh, look forward to digging into this stuff. 
Well, give us a little bit of your background. How okay. did you find yourself in marketing? Who did you work for before you went into your own line of you know, your own agencies? And then how did you find yourself at Stetson? Well, I got my undergrad down in uh, South Florida, University of South Florida in Tampa, stretched a four-year degree to about eight, <laughs> constantly working and taking on different jobs and kind of the, the poor college student. But all the while throughout my college, I had a lot of dogs, somewhat pet poor. And so I found myself working for a veterinary hospital uh, in order to uh, defray some costs for vaccines and uh, other procedures and things like that. As you can... A big dog fan. It even directed your early career, huh? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I was working for the veterinary hospital, uh, got my undergrad in management at South Florida, and thought I'd try and uh, pair those two life events together with my animal health background and a management degree and uh, got a job for that little pet food company up in St. Louis called Purina. Oh. And uh, as most careers start in sales, I um, sold to veterinary practices for about a year and a half, two years. All roads quickly led to St. Louis and very soon found myself in marketing, managing uh, dog chow, which at the time was almost a half a billion dollar brand. And you know, keep in mind, this was back in the 90s, uh, not to date myself, but marketing was all about great creative, you know, lots of TV advertising, print ads, shelf space, point of sale. But I always say it was the greatest place to learn marketing because try selling a product not to the end user. And you really have to be good at marketing. You really have to kind of tap into that emotional connection between the pet and the owner Dogs and cats don't carry wallets and the people don't need the product. So you have to um, kind of stand for something and ultimately tell a good story. So did you, bud, work from the management sales side then into marketing or did it, did all of that come under your purview? No, um, sold for a little while. That's you know where a lot of careers start. Uh, then I managed salespeople for a little while. And then I was uh, always kind of drawn to marketing, you know, even with a management degree, you know, assistant brand manager and kind of worked my way on up, uh, you know, managing some fairly large brands. A position opened up, which was uh, kind of the experiential guru at Perina. And so I had uh, oversight over many of their events and experiential activations, whether it be Meow Mix pop-up stores featuring Eartha Kit in New York City, or uh, you know traveling, you know athletic dog competitions like the Incredible Dog Challenge, which is still running today. You know, I kind of oversaw that and kind of shared best practices between all the brands, which was kind of my last act there at Purina. It was an awesome, uh, you know, first chapter of my career. Even though I had done, you know, many other lower level jobs through college. But uh, this was kind of my first RJ, as if you will, uh, real job. And your experiential marketing side, because you went into that with your own um, agency. What was one of the coolest things you did with experiential marketing for dog food? I, I think it would have to be the challenge, the, the incredible dog challenge. Uh, I want to say it's in about its 22nd or third, maybe 25th year. It is still, you know, one of the, I, I call it lightning in a bottle because it, it took an event where, you know, everybody was used to seeing uh, show dog events, but, you know, we called these the go dogs and they were the athletic dogs. It was dock diving. It was agility. It was fly ball. It was Frisbee, um, you know, it was X games for dogs. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we took that and it became a huge PR machine. I have been on with the dogs, kind of me in the background, Letterman, Leno, Sports Center, the Today Show, Good Morning America, you know, lots of different outlets. And consistently it was achieving 350 to 500 million consumer impressions every single year. Dogs were hot and still are. But, but it was a very interesting campaign because not only did you have a made-for-TV event, which aired six times a year on a variety of networks, but we had a digital um, you know, game that we actually impact into product. We morphed some TV advertising off of it, some print ads off of it, uh, certainly the PR machine. And you, know, you talk about a 360 campaign with all the touch points covered. It was one in a million. So 
that was probably, um, you know, one of my more longer tenured experiential properties and it's still going on today. So, and what did you learn from that? So you launched it, you got it rolling, you had a lot of success over the years. What do you think your biggest takeaways from a professional standpoint or from that? I'll tell it to you from two sides. From the event logistical side, I will say there are no small details. There is no one facet of the event that's either more or less important. One example, uh, we were having a large event, I believe, out west for one of our stops on our challenge series. And everything was going fine until someone realized that, oh, we forgot to order the Frisbees. And during a typical event, you might have, you know, 10 to 12 competitors compete two or three times a day for a couple of days. So, you know, add up the Frisbees, each one requiring about 10 Frisbees. So we had boxes and boxes of Frisbees that someone had ordered, but had not, you know, followed up to make sure they arrived. And so we have an event and we have no Frisbees. And it's like one would think, well, that's a little small thing, but it's not really a small thing because you can't have a show. You know? But what'd you do? Well, we went out and went to about 17 different locations and bought up every single Frisbee we could find. Clearly, they weren't branded, but um, like the ones we had ordered. But, uh, you know, the show must go on, as they say. <laughs> so, um, you know, no, no one particular detail is any more or less important. You got to sweat them all. And then I guess from the consumer side, it was really interesting to see these shelter dogs and, you know, non-pedigreed dogs, uh, certainly not show dogs, that have a love and a passion for their owner and a drive to do well in whatever event they're competing in. And, you know, as the tagline would go, you know, any dog can be incredible given the right training, nutrition, and exercise. And so the the people that were so passionate about their pets and the stories that they wanted to come and tell and you know if you're a dog owner and and i currently don't have a dog but have been for many many years you know it's always a topic of conversation that kind of brings people together and people can always share stories about pets and their breeds and if you have a similar breed you know that conversation is tenfold now people are passionate about their pets so that's kind of the other lesson i learned so what did you do? You moved on out of working for the, the large company and started creating your own marketing firms? In 2004, uh, for family reasons, I moved back to Florida just in time for three hurricanes in the month of August, uh, which was a, a nice welcome home. Um, but anyway, and I said, well, you know, let me hang my shingle as a consultant till I get a real job. And that lasted for almost 10 years. <laughs> But my, my first company, since I had kind of, you know, honed my skills in this experiential world, which, you know, again, if you roll the tape back almost 15 years, experiential was a word that, you know, some couldn't pronounce and, and most didn't know what it means. And, you know, at best, they connected it very directly to event marketing, which, as we know, it's a little broader than that. So I hung my shingle as a consultant and I helped many brands with experiential at retail, event marketing, a series of, tour, of tours with several different brands, MasterCard, AAA, uh, Fuji, NASCAR. And so I, I was kind of the general contractor of the event that would you know, make sure it's, it's on strategy for the brand and then sweat the details and make sure uh, the Frisbees arrived as, as if you will. So. <laughs> Well, you did that for a while. What made you close down your marketing you know, firms and move into education? I, I do want to go back to fish on marketing because I, I, you know, you caught that comment and that was the name of my uh, my consulting operation. But, you know, everyone would ask me, you know, where'd the name come from? And so the, the way I always explained it, which was a great, you know, elevator speech, if you will, is you know, the fish on moment, uh, and everyone can kind of relate, you know, who's caught a fish. Okay. You know, most people have, you know, whether they're fishing with their grandpa or uncles or mom, dads, whatever, they can kind of relate to that bobber sinking the tug on the line. And it, it recalls something in their brain where they can take themselves back there quickly, particularly if it was a very large fish, that moment when the fish is on the line you're impervious to distractions. Your your wallet or your beverage could fall over the side of the boat. You're you're totally, 
you know, immune to what's going on, your, your phone's ringing and you're completely in tune with what's on the other end of that line, even though you may not know what it is. And so I, I would always say if brands can get to that level of connection with a consumer, that's the holy grail. And so I would often kind of position experiences as a way in to that connection point. So fish on marketing always begged the question and allowed me a soapbox to get up and explain what kind of experiential is. And you're out trying to hook the customer. So it makes total sense. Exactly. <laughs> I liked it because um, we used to do a lot of fishing up in the north end of Vancouver Island in British Columbia. And we'd go up every summer at a place called Double Bay Resort. And we could take these little 17 foot skiffs out in the Blackfish Sound and you would see killer whales would surface around you. The wildlife was just unbelievable. And we were going after, of course, the king salmon the king of all salmons, but we would catch a lot of everything else and it never failed, you know, especially once the beer really kicked in, no matter whatever you caught, you were always yelling fish on just to let the other boats know, you know, around you that you were beating them at uh, catching fish. So right. that's, <laughs> that's what I loved about the, the name of your firm. So you went from that into education and how long ago was that? Well, there was a couple of stops in between. I, I worked for Costa Sunglasses down here, which if you're a fisherman, you may know the brand, very popular with uh, optics for sight fishing and things like that. Helped them kind of establish their community-based marketing. And then uh, over about the last five or six years, I had always wanted to teach. Had tried a couple of smaller community colleges nearby and you know really enjoyed the kind of the craft of, of teaching and you know, it was rewarding for me to give back, um, you know, my 25 plus years of branding, marketing, and a little bit of sales experience. I was always impressed with Stetson. My grandparents lived just a few minutes away from DeLand, Florida, growing up. And we used to always go through there and the campus was gorgeous. It's one of the oldest colleges in the state of Florida, university now, you know, founded by uh, the, the hat uh, man, John B. Stetson. And so I, I drove over there. I, I live probably 25 minutes from there, you know, and kind of poked around the university, really fell in love with it and, you know, made some inquiries at the business school and, you know, pretty much got on as an adjunct and taught over the last four or five years, you know, marketing, consumer behavior, PR, professional selling and things like that. Really enjoyed it. It was always just one class a semester, pretty much in the evenings. It got to a point where, you know, starting to get recognized by other faculty and got to know them. And then the dean of the school actually approached me about uh, the position within professional education, which had kind of languished over the last few years due to lack of focus and leadership. And uh, he said, I think you'd be perfect for this. And so we we sat and chatted and, you know, six months kind of went by and, you know, they did their vetting of, of other folks and, um, you know, offered me the job uh, about a year ago. So I've been at the helm of the uh, Stetson Professional and Corporate Education since about August. So. It's kind of interesting hearing your background for me to think about sales, brand marketing, and experiential marketing and how that really all comes together in teaching. It doesn't, it? I mean, because you Absolutely. are now helping to brand Pace at Stetson University, helping with the executives coming through there, but you are also teaching in a very experiential way. Do you think your interest and success in experiential marketing is something that kind of led to this teaching? You know, I don't know which came first, the chicken or the egg, but, you know, very few people can get to a position in life where they have a, a, a career path or a position that they're in that really takes advantage and utilizes 25, 30 plus years of experience and skills and training. And, you know, I've got the MBA and all that, but the sales and the marketing and, you know, this is a very small group at Stetson. Stetson is, is probably a 3000 student university. So, you know, I don't have a huge staff of a dozen people. It's pretty much my, myself and a coordinator. But as you say, we're, we're trying to brand this uh, executive or professional education group. We're trying to sell it. We're, you know, engaging faculty to teach courses like yourself. And I, I hope we'll talk about that course in a little bit. It's, you know, digital marketing. It's how to get awareness. How, how, you know, how do we break out of the sea of sameness of all the other online educational 
uh, providers and, and brands out there. I really feel like, you know, I've reached a point where I'm kind of using everything I've learned. And, you know, all along the way, you may have thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll never use this or I'm moving on to the next chapter and I'll never look back. But I do feel like now that, you know, I'm tapping into pretty much all the things professionally that got me here. So, yeah. And how has COVID-19 upended your world, especially since you really just took this over, what, what you've been at it almost a year. Right. Did you have to just completely redesign your plans for how you were going to teach exec ed? It's kind of good news, bad news. The, the good news is professional education, learning, reskilling, upskilling is pretty hot right now. And, and particularly if you talk to many of the providers of courses, uh, you know, their demand has, you know, 4X versus last year. However, uh, by the same token, you know, this sea of sameness out there and, and leveling the field to where everybody has to compete online somewhat tries to turn it into a commodity. So how do you differentiate an online course from another one? I may be trying to sell a course for $4.99 and someone else is selling the exact same topic. Maybe the curriculum is, I would hope the curriculum is maybe a little less quality, but for $49. As consumers kind of look and it's, well, they both online and they both take about 20 hours to complete. Well, I'll just go with the cheaper one. And, and Stetson is really kind of known for, you know, high touch, high quality, small classroom sizes, you know, small private liberal arts school. And my vision for professional education was that curriculum would not differ too much. And so I was building for a future that while we would have some online courses because it's convenient for working adults, uh, we would primarily base our courses around seated classrooms. That's our thing. And that's what people would expect from us. And as a brand guy, I didn't want to stray too far from the mothership or the parent brand. But COVID has really forced me into launching at least out of the gate, a small catalog of online courses, some taught by faculty, um, some taught by an online learning provider that we partner with to at least get me a product, get me something out there. I don't want to just sit on my hands and wait to launch this whole thing. So we came out right in the middle of it and it was like, okay, I think demand is high. Here's what I've got to go with. And I will slowly backfill with faculty led courses and more seated classes when the time is appropriate. You know, we're moving into some hybrid courses now and still leaning on our online courses to uh, to promote as well. So you saw this uptick in exec ed. Was that prior to COVID? Was that something that was already happening? And have you seen it even increase because of what we've been going through in our bizarre world we're all living in? You know, if you, if you roll the tape back many, many years, education has always served a, a very uh, worthy and valid role in our society. It helps 18, 19, 20-year-olds grow up a little bit. It provides us all with some good background on a wide variety of topics. And it's kind of a leveler or a differentiator, I should say, as you get into the job market. As the old saying goes, it, it proves that you committed yourself to something and did it. Having said that, I feel like education somewhat lags in the needs of the job market. You know, even though we're, we're putting kids through a fairly rigorous curriculum for certain degrees, those degrees are not as valuable to the employer as they once were. Now, this is not to badmouth higher ed. That's my employer, and I, I would never do that. And, and Stetson is doing better than most in terms of enrollments. But the four-year degree is not the sole solution. I, I think employers are looking at other skills that they can either complement their degree with or skills to get into a position. Cybersecurity is a big one these days. The education that we're training for is 20th century education geared for you know, 20th century jobs, but we have 21st century jobs now. AI and automation and... Uh, you know, I was reading somewhere where, you know, a couple of years ago, it, the, the stats were about 70% of the work was done by humans and 30% machines. And in about five years, that's going to be more like 50-50. A lot of jobs, almost 75 million jobs will, you know, have been displaced 
just in a few years, having said that, we'll have another 130 million jobs that are created. And we don't even know what those jobs look like. Yet. Exactly. So how do you prepare for them? If you're smart, you're constantly looking ahead and reskilling yourself for the next opportunity. I read somewhere where the average person will have 10 jobs before they reach age 40, and that number is growing. Gotcha. You remember that when we grew up, our parents had one job for one company and were there for the whole time. And I don't know about you, but I was coached coming out that, you know, you find that employer and you give it your all and hopefully they will keep you around so you can retire one day. And boy, that was never my life. I went through a you know, number of different jobs. And then, of course, being an entrepreneur, started my own company, uh, gosh, 30 years ago now. But our kids, they work for themselves or they've had a number of different employers. And I can't even imagine today's workforce. They are going to go through, I don't know, what did you say, seven to 10 to more? different right. jobs, companies as they as they get through their And careers. it's interesting. I think the World Economic Forum did a future of jobs report a few years back. And it was, you know, why are you changing jobs? And about half of them, as you would expect, is for monetary gain and, you know, financial security and, big, you know, more pay. But the other half was for more autonomy, which was about a third and the other chunk was for purpose and fit. So, you know, I think is the bulk of the workforce now are millennials and Gen Z. You know, I think they're not always just looking for a paycheck. They want to, you know, work for companies that do well by doing good, as they say, and align with their values and, and purpose and things like that. So it, it's an interesting business, but the moral of the story is you have to constantly stay sharp because you never know, you know, what's coming next. I think this this pandemic has shown us that job security is not always what we think it is. Many people are out there displaced or furloughed. They're rethinking their career paths. They're possibly looking at other opportunities, uh, you know, waiting for, you know, maybe a call back or not. And so, you know, now is the time to um, sharpen the saw. You know, when I was working at ASU, I was there for five years as an adjunct and creating a communication storytelling program in their executive masters for sustainability leadership. And Bud, back then, when we were first rolling out the initial course design, we had about 30 experts, scientists, sustainability folks in the crowd as we were, you know, explaining what we we're trying to do and trying to get their input so that we could really dial in this curriculum. And when they introduced me as one of the four professors, I stood up the fourth to go through what I was talking about communications. You could see everybody in that room for the most part lean back, cross their arms, and look at me like, oh, you're the soft skill guy in kind of a condescending way. I had to actually approach that with them and say, well, soft skills, depending on how you add them up against the hard skills of analytics and measurable things, soft skills come into play around communications and relationships and leadership and working in a huge, huge way. And I found myself, and I was surprised because it was the first time I had worked in higher ed, defending <laughs> soft skills. I, I thought they would be more open to that. So now move ahead to, la uh, to last year when LinkedIn came out with a report and they did a study uh, with the future of jobs report. The top five skills <clears throat> that companies are most needing, this says in 2019, now let's fast forward to 2021, is in this order, creativity, persuasion, collaboration, adaptability, time management. All of those are soft sure. skills in my book. And so I think it's really interesting as we are evolving towards AI and machine learning and robotics and so forth. I mean, hard skills and the analytics that make all of that work. What are employee, employers looking for? People that can grow and can have the courage to step out of their comfort zone and can communicate and can can you know bring worlds together. They are looking for those very soft skills that just seven years ago I had a group of people crossing their arms and saying, "Ah, those are nonsense." Pretty interesting no, evolution. Ab absolutely, and um, you know I think as as these professional ed, executive ed courses are more demanded. 
Uh, I, I think you see these millennials, you know, going back to fill in those skills gaps and they're looking for those types of courses. They may not necessarily want an MBA. I call them just in time and only as needed learners. They realize uh, probably because someone has told them or they're looking at a job description and they need it where, okay, I need this and I need this skill gap filled. I, I don't need this broad base of knowledge. I don't need a diploma. I don't need an additional 25 credits. I just need a course in this. Seth Godin, I believe, did a great blog post a while back on the difference between education and learning. Education is more controlled by the, the faculty and the instructors. We, we kind of predetermine what we think this cohort needs to be successful. And, and, you know, often what we learn as a freshman is outdated as, you know, when we graduate. But it, it's kind of a, a, a course that's controlled by someone else, whereas learning is very often controlled by you. You realize you need to learn something. And you, you proactively go and seek that curriculum, find it, absorb it, learn it, and then go back to you know, what you needed it for in the first place. I think there's a, there's a role for both. But right now, um, professional ed is, is hot. And uh, I think just getting hotter as you know, these millennials are, are you know, looking to get their badges and their certifications and you know, they love their participation awards and their trophies. So think about the branding side of it too. But so many folks, and I saw through the executive masters for sustainability leadership. So we were working with executives around the world in a year's time, <clears throat> 12 months, they would get their masters in sustainability leadership. It's a branding tool for them because now they stand out from a lot of other MBAs. A lot of them already had their MBA. Now they wanted to add this to it and color it with something that differentiated them in the marketplace. And it made a huge difference. A lot of them have gone on now to be captains of the sustainability industry with large companies like Cummins Diesel, American Express, Hunter Irrigation, and so forth. How do you see where exec ed professional development really adds to that individual branding? for a person to make them stand out and stand apart from all of the competition that's also trying to get that job that they're going Well, it, it really is a game changer because you have to assume that most people applying for a job that says degree required will have a degree. Then it goes down to, all right, what differentiates you other than you might have gone to the school that the hiring manager went to outside of that? Uh, what, what differentiates you? So if I'm graduating with a management degree, why wouldn't I want to, um, the term used in education is scaffold on a project management certificate, probably a 12 week course that prepares you to take a, a very formalized test. You pass the test and you're certified. You know, now that hiring manager looks at you very differently and you know, that's a more formalized certification, but even if you can add to your resume or your LinkedIn profiles courses in creativity or, you know, managing high producing teams, you know, other things like Six Sigma, if you're going into quality and things like that, there, there's just a plethora of skills that can be taught and it just makes us a better person and uh, makes us a more employable person. I always look at, at professional education as somewhat career insurance. We, we've all seen what can happen. Career insurance basically just bolsters your resume, bolsters your value, and, and makes you more in demand when times are tight. And if you need to pivot, you have the skills to you know, move into a different path and, and maybe seek different employment. The other thing about learning that I've learned anyways and seen in action is you go after that certificate or you go in for that you know, just advanced development in another area, but it also unlocks other passions and curiosities inside of you that takes you in places you never realized were available to you. And you think about Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey. He says, you know, follow your bliss and doors will open where there were only walls before. Learning to me is kind of a, an example of that because you sign up for a course, you've got a curiosity in it, you start pursuing it, 
And it starts opening up all these other doors into interesting curiosities you may not have even known you've had. So you grow as an individual, not just a professional. In Absolutely. The and my hope is that uh, there will be a day when we can gather a cohort together in a classroom. Unlike undergrad degrees, clearly you have a cohort of students uh, from all over the country, but a leadership training class will bring together 15 or 20 individuals from the business community that you may have never met. And the networking potential and value and benefit from professional ed courses is always a little added bonus because you meet people in the world of business to date myself again, your Rolodex uh, can never be too, too thick. So, Well, Bud, let's talk about storytelling in business course, because I was so happy when you called a few months ago and we connected. I don't even remember how you tracked me down, actually, um, but we talked about putting together Absolutely. And, and I've, I've followed you for, for several years as, uh, you know, one of my last consulting gigs was a little one-man effort called Tribe Branding. Coming out of my experiential world and my work with Costa Sunglasses, the kind of the art of storytelling and particularly through, you know, high quality films really uh, intrigued me. And so I, um, you know, worked with brands and small businesses to help them tell their story beyond their about page on their website. Found you, followed you, you know, knew at some point we'd work together. This seemed like a great opportunity to test out a hybrid version of your online course where we're able to offer our Stetson professional ed customers and learners the ability to take your course, but also have some one-on-one -on -one interaction and some classroom time virtual. So yeah, uh, I'm glad we got together on this and uh, that course will launch July 28th. Well, I'm really looking forward to it because I have ever, ever since 2013 been on a mission to prove that soft skills is where it's at and you have to keep developing it. If I go back through that list, you think about storytelling and becoming a better communicator through the power of story. And what I like to teach is, you know, we are all intuitive storytellers as homo sapiens. That's just, we are storytelling apes. What I want to do is move us into intentional storytellers using these three proven frameworks so that you can go in and I would say own any room, own the boardroom in presentation mode, own the break room, talking to your fellow colleagues and pulling them to go together, own the chat room, kind of an old fashioned term for being online and, and communicating and connecting with your audiences and then ultimately owning the living room, which goes back to more of the traditional advertising, marketing, TV it all is based on these same principles of storytelling. And if you look at that list that I mentioned earlier the, of the, the soft skills, storytelling increases your creativity because it makes you think in narrative mode and it makes you really appreciate the people around you and what they're going through and how you can connect with them in a very, very loud and noisy world. As I say, it's, stories help you hack through the noise and hook the hearts of your audiences. Persuasion. People show up in business, but you've seen this, I'm sure, I'm sure millions of times, especially back at Perina, the MBAs enter the room and they're taught to lead with logic, data, stats, facts, charts, graphs. We got to look smart. We have to sound smart. We're in business for Christ's sake. Story has no play in that. Yet without story, we don't put that information in the context and our audiences, no matter how smart they are, sit there dumbfounded because their limbic system just has a hard time of processing data without the context of story. So this plays to the persuasion model. Storytelling, when you get really good at it, you become very persuasive because you're able to connect with that audience through true stories about real people that have had a real impact in the world. You're not just trying to bombard them with stats and facts. A couple of the areas I'm really excited about working with with your students. In awesome. This. I can't wait to uh, get the cohort launched and uh, see you in action. The, I, I have taken a few courses and, and read several books, but the reason that I, I really was kind of drawn to to your course, and I've not taken the online version, but have the, the workbook and the ABT formula and all that, is that a, a lot of the storytelling gurus and consultants and workshop leaders, they spend a lot of time on, you know, why storytelling works and our limbic brain and what uh, stories can do and the power of story, but they don't get into the how. You walk away knowing the power of story, but you don't quite know how to do it any better than you did when you went in. 
as a course, as an educational tool, uh, not just a, a workshop at a trade show, you know, I, I really want people to walk away with the how, and I'm confident that you'll do that. Absolutely. And that's, I teach the applied science, which are those proven narrative frameworks to lead to the bewitchery of storytelling. So when I'm looking at that list of creativity, persuasion, collaboration is another big part, soft skill that storytelling brings to play because with storytelling, you have understanding and empathy. You have to create that with that person sitting across from you to make it work. So collaboration becomes a natural byproduct of that. And what I'm really excited about this course, designing it with you, bud, and I guess now I have a better appreciation given your experiential background and how we are going to do this course. Three weeks, but we're gonna start off with synchronous and a asynchronous learning, big words for me in person to kick off the course, to get everybody you know heads around what we are trying to achieve and get a chance to really meet the cohort that way. Then we'll go three weeks of online training and I'll do a, a another live session at the very end, like a capstone. But in the middle of those three weeks, I'll be available for one-on-one -on -one conversations and each student gets a 45 minute uh, impact call with me to help them work through their storytelling. And I think probably the most important thing always is for me to get across to students is everything you learn will be immediately applicable in your business, in your career, in your job function, in your marketing, whatever it is you're doing, that this is not philosophy or theory. These are the hardcore tools that you can apply immediately to help become a more confident and compelling community. That's awesome. And I, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, I'll be interested to see what the cohort looks like. You may have, you know, people from variety of industries, different levels of positions, but I know they will all benefit from the art of storytelling. Well, Bud, where should we send them? How can they sign up and reserve their place? Well, right if now? you go to stetson.edu forward slash pace which is uh, our acronym for professional and corporate education, you'll get to the site. I think there's one additional click to get to the individual courses. And you're right up there at the top with the storytelling course. And for the next couple of weeks, I think we're actually offering $100 savings for early registrations just to kind of get things moving and um, add a little benefit for, for quick responses. So look forward to that. Check out our LinkedIn page at, at Stetson Professional and Corporate Education. We've got a Facebook page as well, but mostly uh, focus on LinkedIn for a lot of our uh, business communications and networking and things like that. Well, Bud, thank you for being here and thank you for inviting me into the Stetson community. I am so looking forward to launching our course together on the 28th and uh, working with all those wonderful Professor Hal, I appreciate the time that you've given me <laughs> and uh, let's make this happen. Look forward to it. Thank you all for listening to this edition of The Business of Story. If you like what you heard or you want to take advantage of that course, get on over there, stetsonuniversity.edu forward slash PACE, P-A-C-E. We will also have a link to the, the course in the show notes. And feel free to share this episode with anyone you know out there that is looking. Maybe they're searching around. They're trying to redefine their career. Maybe they lost their job during COVID and they want to level up a little bit in their knowledge and their skill development. Or maybe it's just you and you want to follow that curiosity. The one thing about this course in storytelling is it makes you get much clearer on your own personal story. What is your purpose in the world and how can you go out and realize it in the ideal perfect job where you are not only contributing to a company and maybe it's your own company, but you're actually building community about around what you care about the most. So check that out. If I can be a service to you, visit me at businessofstory.com. My new book is out, Brand Be Witchery. You know where to find that at amazon.com, both print and Kindle version. New author's best friend is not only the reader, but the ratings and review. Please leave one if you would. It helps me get found in the Amazon jungle. If there's anything else I can do for you, you know where to track me down at park at businessofstory.com. So I look forward to having you back here again next week when we will have another great story artist on here like Bud. And until then, remember that the most potent story you'll ever tell is the story you tell yourself. So make it a great one. Thanks for listening.